Here's a summary of the molecular components of protein expression vectors from the previous video. In this video, we shall explore gene structure in RNA, its codon bias and optimization, and some common engineering involved in protein expression vectors. Let's start with a template and compare the different types of gene structures. Genes as seen in DNA are intronless in prokaryotes, versus the eukaryotic ones are interrupted by introns. A typical gene in a prokaryote looks like this. It has a promoter and terminator element with some protein coding DNA in the middle. The promoter recruits RNA polymerase hollow enzyme and makes RNA starting from the transcription start site until the termination. And the mRNA generally has untranslated regions at the ends. At the 5' end following the UTR, a ribosome binding site can be found, which overlaps or contains the start codon. This is where ribosomes assemble and start protein synthesis. The ribosome reads three bases at a time, called codons, and it stops when it encounters a stop codon. In this mRNA, the portion that literally gets translated into a protein by the ribosome is called the open reading frame. The ORF in the final mRNA is always contiguous. A eukaryotic gene has quite similar features, a promoter to start transcription and a terminator to stop it. The mRNA has a few extra bells and whistles. In its raw form, the mRNA is interrupted by introns. Through some complex transcriptional processing, all the interrupting parts are removed, and only then do you get the final mRNA. This mature RNA has the contiguous ORF, which gets translated into a protein. Let's just compare prokaryotes and eukaryotes for a second. You may have realized that the prokaryotic gene is contiguous even at the DNA level, but the eukaryotic gene is split into parts. Here's how all this fits in a big picture. The gene, so to speak, at the DNA level is around 1 kb in prokaryotes. A typical length of the mRNA is just under 1 kb. And since the UTRs are so short, the effective ORF is also around the same length. In eukaryotes, and humans specifically, the average gene length is around 30 kb. The immature RNA is roughly 30 kb as well, but the mature mRNA is only around 1.5 kb, which is only 5% of the gene length. This means that 95% of a gene does not encode for a protein. So a huge portion is not part of the final ORF. Now that you understand gene and RNA structure, let's discuss how you would get a template for your protein expression vector. For a prokaryotic gene, you can amplify the gene and therefore the ORF directly from the genome. On average, it'll be a reasonable 1 kb PCR, and you can express that gene in either a prokaryote or a eukaryotic host. Just to be explicit, the amplification is using primers near the start and stop codons of the ORF. The choice of ribosome binding site will depend on the expression host. The intron-less eukaryotic genes are simple. Just like bacteria, you amplify them right off the DNA. For intron-containing genes, that'll be a 30 kb PCR. A 30 kb PCR is possible, but no, thanks. But let's imagine you could do this routinely. Totally hypothetical. The next step would be to ligate the PCR amplicon into a plasmid. A typical vector backbone is around 3 kb. The insert, the PCR product, is 30 kb. Even if you magically manage to clone it, it'll be a 33 kb plasmid. A plasmid is typically less than 25 kb. Even that is pushing the limits, but a 33 kb plasmid is absurd. But what if the insert was 10 kb instead of 30 kb? In that case, the final plasmid is 13 kb. Now, this seems more reasonable. By the way, this is all still hypothetical because our PCR comes right off the DNA. In a moment, you will find out why this is the wrong way. So, you've cloned a 10 kb long gene with introns in a plasmid. And here's the expected structure of our hypothetical final plasmid. Now, let's suppose you express this in a bacteria. The promoter in this plasmid will be compatible with the bacterial RNA polymerase which makes a 10 kb mRNA from it. What happens now? Will it make your desired protein, even if you have the bacterial ribosome binding site and everything on the mRNA? Well, the answer is no. Bacteria do not understand introns, 
or discontiguous ORFs, since they don't have introns. They don't have the splicing enzymes to understand this language. Since this is all imaginary, say the bacteria could understand intron and exon language. Another way to think about it, say you express this plasmid in a eukaryote. I mean, eukaryotes deal with introns all the time. This is not hypothetical anymore. In eukaryotes, from this gene, you could potentially get three types of mRNA. And assume that E1, E3 is what you expect. I think you see where this is going. We have a mix of other mature RNAs produced from this plasmid, which means you make three types of protein from this plasmid. This is just alternative splicing in action. Our job is to get one protein, not a mix. Then how do you get templates from intron-containing genes? Well, we work our way backwards. First, you extract RNA from a human cell where this protein is expressed. In that RNA pool, you will have that one specific mRNA that makes your protein. You convert the mRNA into complementary DNA using reverse transcription and amplify the cDNA into a PCR amplicon. Just so that this is explicit, first you need to create a reverse primer anchored at the stop codon for your specific mRNA. Through reverse transcription, you get the cDNA in the first strand synthesis. Then you come with a forward primer anchored at the start codon to do a regular PCR. This gives you the final template from one mature RNA. In this, there is no intron language to decipher for the cell. You can put this PCR amplicon into a plasmid. This amplicon represents the contiguous ORF, and on average, it is only about 1.5 kb in length. It can be expressed in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and produced just the one protein you want, so no contaminating isoforms. The second big problem with protein expression systems is optimizing for codon bias. Let's talk this through by an example. Suppose you want to express the human insulin protein in a bacteria. The insulin gene has introns. Given what you've learned so far, you would take the mRNA, make cDNA, and use that as a template for your expression vector. When this vector is in the bacteria, an mRNA will be made. Now, do you expect this mRNA to work? If it does, will the protein synthesis be efficient? Well, let's find out. In general, there are 61 codons that correspond to 20 odd amino acids. Here's an example of arginine, which has six corresponding codons. Interestingly, if you look at the bacteria and how these codons are distributed across genes, or ORFs specifically, you find that not all codons are distributed equally, which means not all codons are used equally. And if you look at arginine codon usage in humans, the usage frequency is very different from bacteria. You can also notice that AGA and AGG codons are rarely used in bacteria, but human ORFs love AGG and AGA codons. In contrast, bacteria use CGU a lot, humans not so much. Now, why does it matter for our protein expression? When we talk about codon usage or bias, we refer to the corresponding tRNA availability. For AGA and AGG in bacteria, it means that the corresponding tRNA is rarely expressed. Here, our goal is to take the human ORF and express it in a bacteria. Suppose the insulin ORF has an AGA codon. What happens if the ribosome meets an AGA codon? Since AGA is rarely used in bacteria because its corresponding tRNA is not expressed at high levels, the ribosome will have to wait. It'll get paused or stalled for a bit. If the AGA tRNA doesn't show up on time, the ribosome might abruptly terminate translation. So from this, you will likely have a low yield because the speed of the ribosome making the protein is slow because it spends more time at the rare codons. If the ribosome terminates abruptly, well then you get a truncated protein, which is bad. In templates for protein expression vectors, the codon usage bias has to be optimized. How do you optimize it? Let's go back to the AGA codon and arginine example. In protein expression, you only care about the amino acid sequence. From this codon usage, we see that the bacteria uses CGU a lot more frequently. So all you have to do is switch the AGA with CGU for expression in bacteria. Now the ribosome does not have to wait too long for the corresponding tRNA to show up. This codon usage applies to any host. 
If you were expressing a protein in insect cells, the codon usage for insects looks very different. So you have to optimize the codons according to the insect host. So codon optimization is a host specific issue. Here I took the example of arginine, but codon bias has to be fixed for every single amino acid. This may sound somewhat straightforward. I mean, we want to avoid ribosome pausing and premature termination, so you swap the rare codon to a commonly used codon, right? Hmm, actually, not so fast. And let me show you why this may sometimes backfire. Let's go back to the AGA codon in the insulin mRNA. It is possible that changing AGA to CGU can alter the mRNA structure. An AGA at a specific spot may not result in a weird looking RNA folding. But what if replacing it with CGU causes a big change? Change so big that it may block ribosome movement. On the contrary, sometimes the fact that rare codons are used is actually a good thing. It is often a way to control protein folding. A slow moving ribosome allows the polypeptide to fold appropriately. If it moves too fast, some proteins may misfold. So, when swapping codons and optimizing usage, it is important to look at the bigger picture as well. Now, let's engineer things outside of the ORF. And let's take the example of the same heterologous expression, which is you have a protein template taken from a species 1 and you want to express in a different, unrelated species. Let's take this human insulin and bacteria example. Turns out, human insulin has three disulfide bonds. If you recall the previous video on proteins and host physiology, you know that insulin now must be shunted into the periplasmic space. You could be taking a different protein, which is cytosolic in humans, but you want to secrete it in the bacterial system. First, let's get back to insulin. Given disulfide bonds in the protein, you want the protein to end up in the periplasmic space. For that to happen, you need a signal that tells the protein to be transported there. After reaching periplasm, the signal is removed and you get your final protein. In bacteria, the signal of localization to the periplasm can be taken from any naturally occurring periplasmic protein. And here's a short list of some of them. So in practice, when you take the ORF or cDNA from the human insulin, you need to attach a localization signal to the ORF so when the translation occurs, it gets to the appropriate location. Just like periplasmic localization, there are secretion signals as well. These signals are proteins that get moved out of the bacteria via SEC or SPR mechanisms. And just like localization, you would need to add it to the ORF and that'll cause the protein to be kicked out of the cell. Now, suppose you wanted to purify a cytoplasmic protein. It is easy if the protein is secreted out of the cell. For cytosolic proteins, affinity tags or epitopes are helpful for purification. This works with the same principle. The affinity tag is a short sequence that needs to be added to the ORF. And here's a short list of commonly used affinity tags. But how do these tags help in purification? When you burst open a cell to purify your protein, all the bacterial proteins are mixed with your desired protein. But if you have a tag on your specific protein, you can use some ligands that bind to this tag to specifically pull out your protein from the mix. This is like using a magnet to find iron particles in sand. By doing this, you retain your protein and all other useless mix gets washed away. Once this is done, you break this ligand interaction and obtain your specific protein. You can use this tag in other ways as well. For instance, if you don't have any antibodies for your proteins, you can use antibodies against the tag and if the antibody has a fluorophore attached to it, that can be used in staining or microscopy or just good old blots. This may seem straightforward, but here's something to consider. The epitope in some odd cases can affect the protein activity. Here's how. As a linear molecule, a protein has N and C terminal ends. When a polypeptide folds, one of the ends is typically buried within the folded protein, and one of the ends is typically exposed. It is common practice to add a tag to the exposed terminal. If you add it to the buried end, you may expose this terminal, in which case the protein may unfold, become inactive or unstable. When you add a new tag to your protein, maybe you don't want it around, especially if it affects protein activity and behavior. In those cases, it is perhaps best to add a cleavage site between the tag and your protein. 
enzymes like thrombin, kinases, and factor 10A love to chew on these domains. And if you have specific cleavage site, your protein and the tag will be split into two parts. This is by no means a comprehensive list of tags. When producing proteins, it is possible that your protein is not soluble and therefore aggregates in a cell. This can cause protein misfolding and inactivity. To prevent this, you add a solubilization protein sequence that improves protein stability. There are many other things you can engineer to a protein, depending on the use and application. In the next video, we will use this information to build specific protein expression vectors.